All right. So, hey, um, kids, you are dismissed, and uh, youth ministry, so that's junior high and up in through high school. You guys are dismissed. Pastor Chris is right over there at the door if you want to get while the getting's good. We are awfully glad to see you guys this morning uh, for coming out in the rain. I think there's a special blessing for each of you guys today. And that special blessing is First Peter chapter 1. So um, you can turn to First Peter chapter 1. I'm not going to make a whole lot of opening comments uh, because I have too many comments as part of our uh, message today. Um, so I will just again reiterate that we're awfully glad you're here, whether you're in a great place in your walk or struggling in your walk, you're in the right place because uh, God's word is uh, the antidote and the answer that we also desperately need. So um, if you guys are good, let's go ahead and pray. We're going to jump right in. As I said, I've got a few extra pages of notes today, but if we're not done by, by about noon, then we'll cater lunch. So don't worry. They'll just pass it out in... No, I'm kidding. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this morning, and we thank you so much for your word. And Lord, how excited we are to be diving in this morning to a new book, Lord, and to hear uh, from a fresh voice, Lord, although we, we trust, Lord, we know that, uh, that it's all one voice, Lord, that it all comes from you. And so we pray, Lord, that your spirit would be our teacher today. We pray that you would speak to us through your word. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear what he would say to your church today. And so we thank you, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, 1 Peter chapter 1, it's toward the end, but not quite as much toward the end as where we have been. Just to the, uh, to the left, a few pages of the book of Revelation. And this letter was written in the year A.D. 64, and that was a very pivotal point in church history. And I know we're all familiar to a point with church history, but we, we know, of course, Jesus began his public ministry in A.D. 30. He was crucified in A.D. 33, which, of course, led to the birth of the church there in Jerusalem. We've seen together, as we've studied through the book of Acts in detail, it's that story of the founding of all of these local church fellowships really throughout the surrounding areas and out into what was then the known world, controlled, of course, by the Roman Empire. Especially, we looked in detail at Paul's missionary journeys as he planted and then ministered to all of these different fellowships. And we also saw during that time the seeds of persecution which were being sown against the Christian faith. First of all, by the unbelieving Jews, and then we started to see from the surrounding Gentile pagan people. And now 30 years later, so the year is AD 64, and what we see is that those tiny seeds of persecution are really about to come to full bloom, if you will. We are at the eve of the greatest outbreak of persecution that the Christian church had known and really would ever know. And it all came at the hands of a madman named Caesar Nero, right? The fifth emperor of the Roman Empire. And with him, we see that this persecution against Christians, which had kind of been simmering all up until this time, really comes to a full boil on July 19th, AD 64, when Caesar Nero himself set fire to the city of Rome. He was determined, of course, to, to stamp his image forever on a new Rome, and so he hired arsonists to destroy the old one. And we've all kind of heard that well-known expression about Caesar fiddling while Rome burned. And while we don't know if that happened literally, we do know that Caesar was indeed fiddling around definitely. You guys see what I did there with fiddling around and with the fiddle? Wow, this is going to be a long morning. Okay. So at this point, Caesar knew he had to find a scapegoat. And he found a great one very conveniently in the Christian community. Right? He said, look, I'm not the one that burned the city. It's those people who are always talking about the unquenchable fires of hell. You know, and you combine that 
then with this kind of a growing concern that because these Christians were always talking about love and talking about purity, that somehow their lifestyle was a great threat to the rampant perversity that was such a part of the Roman culture. And so it didn't take long before the general population of the entire Roman Empire was eager and even quick to blame Christianity for what was this crumbling society as well as their charred capital city. And so just months later, right, just after this letter was written, Nero launched an official government-backed brutal, murderous persecution of all of the Christians within the early church. And it was a persecution which would ultimately result in the annihilation of six million Christians throughout the empire. Right, stories of them being lit up as candles to light up these garden parties that this madman Caesar would throw. Right? Of course, we know they were fed to lions to the delight of these jeering crowds. Now, I know we don't usually spend that much time on the precise dating of one of these letters because it normally doesn't make that much difference for what we're doing here on a Sunday morning. And yet, in this case, it's very significant because it's against this backdrop, right? It's under the inspiration of the Spirit in anticipation of this terrible time, right? Written to these people who would be understandably vulnerable to confusion and to depression, right? They're questioning the reason for all of this relentless persecution. It's against all of that that we read in verse one of First Peter one, where it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So in the year AD 64, the apostle Peter wrote the letter of First Peter. Now, as obvious as that statement might sound, it was really just as recently as 1947 when a new school of thought sort of emerged, declaring that it would have been impossible for a fisherman like Peter to employ the kind of you know, complex sentence structures and the sophisticated vocabulary that we're gonna see as we go through this letter. So it called the Apostle Peter's credentials into question by some who are prone to those kinds of lies, right? And yet what we know is that certainly it was a lot earlier than 1947 when Peter's credentials were first called into question. Because remember, back in the book of Acts, Luke recounts for us in chapter 4 of that book that it was after hearing Peter speak that it was the supposed learned men of the day they also wondered how it was that he was able to speak with such clarity and with such authority. And in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, it says that when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but that verse is super encouraging to me. Because what it reminds us is that just hanging out with Jesus can make a smart man out of anybody. Amen? So Peter, of course, one of the 12 disciples, Peter had eaten with him. He traveled alongside Jesus for three years. And the result of that time spent was plainly obvious. And so, too, as we spend time now soaking up these words of one who had been hanging out with Jesus, my prayer is the same, that some of these characteristics of Jesus would be just as noticeably and as readily and as wonderfully evident in our lives as they were in this fisherman turned disciple turned scholar turned Apostle Peter. Now, the term apostle is a pretty fancy one, but it simply means sent one. So Peter is one sent by Jesus. He's one of the original 12 disciples, and now he's left. He's sent out by Jesus to minister to his people in his name. And so when Peter takes and he speaks of himself here, by the Spirit of God, he speaks of himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. 
he's really taking on this mantle of this apostolic authority in which he is writing this letter. So it's to be read, it's to be understood. These words are to be taken as applicable to all of us as coming from Jesus himself. Peter, Paul, John, right? All of them apostles, all sent by the Lord Jesus. Three different men, so they have a common calling, but they each have extremely different giftings, right? You look at the writings and the ministries of these different men that God used, we see that Paul is often considered to be the apostle of faith because he most clearly articulates better than any other author this doctrine of how we're justified by faith. John is known through his personality and through his writings as the apostle of love. Peter, we're going to find, Peter's often called the apostle of hope. Because more than any other author, Peter stresses hope as the answer to persecution and the answer to difficulty. And that encouragement, don't give up, which is the title of our text today, as well kind of of this whole study through 1 Peter. So all of this is at the heart of what Peter communicates in this letter. He writes, again, look at the end of verse 1. He's writing to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, all of these places we saw in the book of Acts, they simply relate to regions in the Roman Empire, all in that area of what we would today call modern Turkey. There were these infant churches with these baby believers who were just starting to grow in their faith, but many of whom had already suffered one great wave of initial persecution, which had driven them out of the city of Jerusalem, out of Israel itself, and into these surrounding Gentile nations. That word there, dispersion, it actually means sprinkled or scattered. And I love that because what it tells us is that almost as if by the hand of the Lord, these believers had been sprinkled like salt and they had been scattered like seed throughout these five main provinces of Asia Minor. And they were now living there, Peter says, as pilgrims, or maybe some of your translations say that they were strangers. And of course, the idea of stranger or of pilgrim, simply of someone who is displaced, right, unfamiliar, who's living there in a foreign land. And so it so perfectly not only describes these Christians then, but it also should describe us as Christians even now. And that title, if you will, speaks to any Christian who feels increasingly displaced or lost in the world in which we live. Paul tells us very clearly, he says in Philippians chapter 3, that our citizenship is where? The answer is on the blackboard, right? Our citizenship is in heaven. And so this side of heaven... We are part of an empire in which we don't fit. We're part of a system with which we don't agree. We are just pilgrims, right? This world is not our home. We're just passing through on the way to our real home. And we know that that journey is increasingly not an easy one. And as we look at the horizon, right, of current events and of the world around us, we can see that it's going to be increasingly, increasingly not an easy one. And this is why I think Peter's words are as needful now as they were for the early church. These people knew persecution. They knew difficulty for their faith. But here Peter takes under the inspiration of the Spirit, he sits down and he starts to write them this letter because as much as they had known great persecution at the hands of the Jews, it was nothing compared to what was coming at the hands of of Rome. And so this is one of the reasons I wanted us to look at these letters of First and Second Peter, is that they are written to Christians specifically to encourage us in the midst of deep trial, in the midst of deep suffering that we go through during this journey. And I can't tell you how many times over the years of my ministry that you, you come to a person and they find themselves in deep, going through something, a kind of a deep a gut-wrenching, life-altering kind of a trial. 
They've got something going on in their life that looks like they may never recover from it. The death of a child, the death of a spouse, you know, a diagnosis, right? And in some cases, we know that they may not recover from it. And yet it's at those precise times in their life when they can turn right to these letters of First and Second Peter to regain their perspective. Now, we can turn anywhere in the Bible, right, and, and be given perspective, and yet First and Second Peter are going to speak specifically to those kinds of times because they're written to Christians who are in the middle of great suffering, and they're written in order that we'd be able to keep our perspective at the very times when we are most prone to lose our perspective and at those very times in life when we can least afford for that to happen. And so these letters of First and Second Peter, I think we need them to be friends, right? We need them to be our good friends in our Christian life. We need to turn to them often as we continue on this pilgrimage, right? So Peter's writing these letters to encourage these Christians. And notice how as we start out that he starts off by encouraging them first by reminding them of who they and reminding us of who we are first. He says in verse 2 that we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. So first and foremost, Peter reminds us what? We are saved. And that in and of itself should be the single most encouraging fact in our life. It is the single greatest thing that has ever happened to any one of us this morning who is saved. It's the single greatest miracle that can happen in a human life. And it's a miracle which Peter points out involved all three persons of the Godhead. Notice he speaks of the Father, he speaks of the Spirit, he speaks of the Son, right? All three of them involved in our salvation in their unique and miraculous way. He says that we're chosen there by the Father, right? Paul tells us before the foundation of the world, Peter says here that it's based on the Father's knowledge of our response to his love on his foreknowledge, right? Then we're set apart unto faith by the Spirit. The Spirit's the one who then draws us, brings conviction to us of our sinful condition. And then, upon our obedience and our surrender to that conviction, then we're cleansed of our sin, we're made completely clean by the Father as that blood of the Son, Jesus, which he shed for us on the cross of Calvary so many years ago, that blood is then applied to our sin. So the Father chose you in Christ. The Son saved you when he died for you. But it took your surrendering to the Spirit in order to seal that transaction. Now Peter's point in pointing all of this out is not to start some sort of a big theological debate, which we are not going to have this morning, right? But it's so that we would understand, Peter says, guys, understand, the entire Trinity, the whole Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they are all in love with you. They have been working for you from before the foundation of the world. They are all involved in sort of partnering with you, if you will, in saving you from hell. And not only does that change our destiny eternally, but it also has a great impact on our daily experience, you know, temporally, right? It has a great impact on our lives here and now by imparting to us again and again, what does it say at the end of the verse? Grace to you and peace be multiplied. So this grace and this peace in Peter's greeting here don't just come from the Apostle Peter as the author, but really they come directly from the Lord as the provider. Grace here doesn't refer to saving grace of God from judgment. Because understand, the believers he's writing to, they already had that. But instead it refers to the sustaining grace that we each need for daily living. And in the same way, peace 
doesn't refer to that peace with God because these believers, they had already made their peace with God when they first believed in God. But instead, this refers to the peace of God. And that's that peace that comes to us as we abide in and as we trust in the love of God and as we seek to walk in obedience to Jesus. And this is why this has become kind of the standard greeting you see in so many of the New Testament letters. And yet, did you notice that we always see them in this same order? It's always grace first and then peace because you cannot know the peace of God until you've experienced the grace of God. But notice what Peter does here, and I love it. He takes that grace and he takes that peace and he does something very special with them. And what is it? He multiplies them. Right, moved by the Spirit, right, discerning in the Spirit, Peter could see the handwriting on the wall and all the trouble that was brewing, and he knew that it would only be by the grace and the peace of God multiplied over and over in the lives of these precious brothers and sisters. That would be the only thing which would and could sustain them through what's coming. And so now he starts now to build on this foundation, right? All of these things already that we have to be thankful for just because of our relationship with the Lord, those things that we've got even in the middle of our greatest trials, those things which don't change even in the midst of terrible persecution. And now Peter goes on and he describes this, these lives that we as believers can still live in this hostile world because of this grace. And in light of this peace. And he says that first of all, starting in verse 3, he says that we should live in hope. Look at verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So to these people who he knew were feeling discouraged and displaced and distressed and probably in danger, Peter immediately gets right to the heart of the issue and he says, we have a living hope based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Understand, here they are, by the time they get this letter, they are right in the middle, literally, of life and death. We're talking about savage, murderous persecution that was only going to get worse and worse as the years go on. And he reminds them of the fact that even in the middle of it, that Jesus provides us with this incredible hope. It's this living hope. It's a hope that has an answer for death. It's a hope that has conquered death and defeated death because, of course, Jesus himself defeated and conquered death. And we know that he did it because of his resurrection from the dead. And this demonstration of his authority and his victory over death and then of his unique ability to impart that victory, to let us share in it with him. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says that the unsaved person is without hope. And yet as believers here... Here we have a living hope because we have a living Savior. Again, Paul says that Christ is our hope. And I don't know, maybe some of you can think back to a time in your life before you knew Jesus when you too had no hope. You didn't know for sure when you couldn't say for sure how this was all going to possibly work out, where you were going to end up once it did work out. But you think about just how rich we are now, right? No matter what it is that we're facing, things, you know, we can come to some major trial in our life, some legitimate disaster, even the threat of death itself, and yet we know that we still have this hope. We can live in this complete peace as it relates to death or the very worst thing that life can throw at us, and it's all because of this living hope. And so Peter reminds us next, he says, you didn't even have to work for this hope, but instead this hope is just a beautiful part of kind of our spiritual 
birthright, right? In verse 4, he tells us we've been begotten again or we've been born again into, look what it says, into an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. So just as we were each born first into a world with no hope, now we've been born again into this living hope. And hope, that word hope, is literally a confident expectation. It's not a hope so, it's an I know so. It's a confident expectation of heaven itself and of this heavenly inheritance, right, this redemption of our souls. And so this is talking about all of these blessings of heaven that we have as pilgrims here on earth. We've just spent the last few weeks looking at them in the book of Revelation. You know, we have this living hope, this everlasting life, this reward, this heavenly spiritual inheritance. We have this entire eternity that is planned for us and it is ours and it is waiting for us in the glory of heaven right this moment. And you put yourself in the place of these persecuted Christians and you think about how profoundly that truth would have impacted them practically. You think about so many of them who've made a stand for the Lord. They've made a profession of faith in the Lord and so they were rejected by their families and as a result, they would have been written completely out of any earthly inheritance that they had coming. And so Peter comes in and he says, hey, listen, I know this is rough. And I know this is rough to go through this. But don't forget about the true inheritance that you have in heaven. Because nobody can touch that, he says. Nobody can mess with that. It is a sure thing and it is coming your way. And it's kind of a funny thing, but you, know, you notice that our human hope fades, unlike this living hope, which actually grows with time. You know, as I was growing up, there was no shortage of hopes and dreams that I had of, I wanted to be a famous this, or a successful that, or a really prominent, you know, whatever other thing. was. But then as my life went along, right, I kind of hit some bumps and turns in the road, and those hopes seem to sort of fade until I met Jesus. And at that point, I came to really understand where my true hope was all the time. It's safe there in heaven with him. And I imagine that the same is probably true for so many of you today. We go down the road of life, and it seems like we're just crossing off more and more things that maybe we thought we would someday do or we thought we would someday be. And yet, in God's economy, in our new lives with Christ, the opposite is true. Because the further down the road we get, the, f the more we walk with Jesus, the more we realize that our hope doesn't depend on anything on this, this earth at all. But it's all about that hope, that sure reality of us in heaven with him and who we are on earth in him. So we don't need to be people that wrestle with hopelessness or encounter some sort of midlife crisis because wherever we are today, tomorrow, our hope will actually be just that much closer. Every day our hope grows. And so it's not only is it a living hope, but it's a lasting hope. It's safe. It says there it's reserved in heaven where it cannot decay. He says it's incorruptible. It can't be defiled or lose its beauty or lose any of the, the delight that's associated with it. Not only does Peter say that the hope is reserved and kept preserved, but he says that we as believers too, look what it says in verse 5, he says, we are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So not only do we have this eternal inheritance awaiting us in heaven, not only is God keeping that for us, but he's keeping us for that. See, we are assured of this living hope and it has nothing to do with how good we are or how able we are or how faithful we are. It has only to do with how good and faithful and able God is. 
you think about when a, when a father takes his precious child and he tries to cross the street. And what's the first thing he says? Hold on to daddy's hand. And the child does. And yet if the child gets forgetful or fatigued and happens to loosen the grip on his father's hand, it really doesn't matter, does it? Because although the child thought they were holding daddy's hand, in reality, it was daddy who was holding their hand. And he would never let go because that child is so precious to him. And so often we think that we're the ones holding on to the Lord. But in reality, he's the one that's holding on to us. Literally kept. And the word there is guarded like the way a soldier guards something, right? We are kept by his power because of the faith that we've placed in him. And I know it's so easy sometimes to get into that dark place where we think, well, you know, it's, it's all great that the Bible says that there's inheritance up there, but you don't know me. I'm going to blow it. Somehow I'm going to fail. Somehow I'm going to ace myself out. I'm not going to make it. This trial is too great. I'm going to fall away or I'm just going to walk away. And Peter says, no. Peter says the reward is there and God knows exactly what it is he's dealing with when he's dealing with you and he will get you there. Right? God will get you there. And you think about how this would impact these people that he's writing to. How they would just be the joy when they heard these things, right? Because that is good news. And Peter knew it. And he said as much in verse 6, he says that in this you greatly rejoice. Though, now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. He says even though things are falling apart in front of you, and even though they're coming apart all around you, you can keep your eyes fixed on what's ahead for you. And I'm sure that you've all heard that expression, that a faith that can't be tested is the faith that can't be trusted. And as Peter's going to tell us next, what we already know, that trials and testing are just a part of this process because they are a part of this life as pilgrims here on this planet. And yet what he says here is that they are a temporary part. And this is the key to Peter's point. And I love this. And if, if you're in the middle of great suffering, even this morning, those four words in that verse, they are very underlinable. Is that underlinable? I'm not even sure if that's a word. But do it anyway. When he says there that it's for a little while. Because there is eventually going to be an end to them. Even though it seems like it won't end. It seems like we won't make it through. And I have to say, I'm not sure that any of our English translations do justice to what Peter is saying when they use the word there, grieved, that we're grieved by our trials. So often I think it seems like the trials that come upon us in life, it seems like maybe the word crushed or wrecked or devastated might have been a better word for the kinds of these severe trials that can come into our life. Grieved almost make it sound like we're dealing with allergies, right? Oh, I was kind of grieved by, the, you know. But in using the specific word that Peter used here, he's using the very same word that Luke uses to describe what it was that Jesus was enduring there in the Garden of Gethsemane. When it says in Luke chapter 22, 44, that being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Right, as he looked ahead to this trial of the cross. So, so Peter isn't, right? The Lord isn't minimizing the reality of what it is that we're fearing or, or feeling or this thing that we're facing. But instead he says, I know what you're going through and I know that it's heavy. I know that it's incredibly heavy. I know that it is blood sweating, agonizing kind of heavy. But it's only for a season. And so Peter continues now next, you know, tells us that we can even rejoice greatly in this because God is working out something that is so much more valuable and so much more eternal than our current state of comfort. And that is in verse 7, 
that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We all know it, right? God refines our faith through our trials. And so Peter is telling them and he's reminding us that we can be confident that God will overrule every fiery trial, every difficulty that we go through. He will overrule it and he will use it for his purposes and for our good. And how in the world could we possibly believe that that's true? Calvary. When we look at how God was able to take the worst thing that man has done in all of human history, and yet he takes it and he works it together for good for the very ones who did it, and that tells us that there is no situation in our lives that he can't make to praise him and that he can't make good for us. And that's a truth that we need to know in our hearts when we find ourselves in the middle of a trial, that God is making our faith so much more valuable. So much so, Peter compares the trials of our faith, what? To the testing of gold as by fire. And as he did it, what Peter's doing is he's reaching back to a statement made by a man who knew uniquely in all of human history what it meant to really go through trials and endure difficulties. In Job chapter 23, Job finally sees the hand of God in the midst of his terrible trial. And he says this, he says, but he knows the way that I take. And when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. And of course, back in Bible times, when someone wanted to make something of fine gold, they would take first the unrefined gold, and they would subject it to such intense heat that it would turn to liquid, and then all of those impurities would be burned out of it. And the goldsmith would know that the work was done when he could look into that pot and see the expression of his own face in that purified gold. And of course, we know that the very same thing is true with us. It's like the Lord says, hey, I've got big plans for you, right? I've got huge plans for you, right? I've got plans not only for this life, but for all of eternity. And because of that, I may need to turn up the heat a little bit just to work out some of these impurities. And yet, uh, my hand is on the fire, right? I know exactly what I'm doing. And although at this present moment you might not like it, you will be thanking me for it for the next billion years to come. He says, because what I'm after is to see the reflection of my face in your life. Right? We were all created, it says, in the image of God. And yet because of the fall and because of our sin, that image has been marred. And yet the Lord is bringing us back to that. He's bringing us back to that place of purity, but he's doing it one trial at a time. Paul said this, that we, are, we all with unveiled face, we behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We're being transformed into that same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Right? There's this process we're becoming more and more in the image of Jesus, and yet we know there are things in each of our lives which keep that from happening. And so God, the way that he deals with it, he says, okay, i got to turn the heat up a little bit. I'm going to allow the heat to be turned up so that I can burn away some of these things. Did you know that the more that you refine gold, the more valuable, the more pure it becomes? And our lives become more and more valuable and they become more and more pure as we simply continue to walk with the Lord through these trials that he allows in our lives as a part of living in this fallen world. And yet he promises us that they won't go unrewarded. And it's when we really can understand this, then we come to that place like Peter says here, where we can rejoice even in the difficulty rather than rebel against it because we can recognize his hand in it 
And it's all a part of this purifying process that's going to work these wonderful things into our lives, not only now, but for all of eternity and to the glory, it says, of our Savior, whom he says in verse 8, having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, uh, the salvation of your souls. So not only do these trials strengthen our faith in the Lord, but Peter says that they actually deepen our love for the Lord. Right, for three years, right, Peter had walked with Jesus. He'd seen him face to face. He even is one of the three who got kind of a sneak preview of the true deity of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And so here Peter is speaking from experience, right, personal experience. And he's encouraging these troubled saints that they indeed would experience an even deeper love for Jesus. They'd, they'd get a, a new perspective about Jesus due to these trials that they walked through with Jesus as their faith is developed and deepened in him. Right? Our eternal salvation is made much more precious by our earthly suffering, even when we don't understand what's happening to us. And I love the example that Peter uses next. In these next three verses, he reminds us that it's of this salvation, he says, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven things which angels desire to look into. So, understand that this glorious salvation that we've accepted and received and that we are currently walking in, it's a salvation that the prophets, we know that they spoke of it long before Jesus ever even came to earth, and all of it, Peter says, was being prepared specifically for us. And so for all the problems that we are going through, for all the problems that we might go through, for all the problems that these Christians to whom Peter's writing would go through, understand this morning that we are living a life that Isaiah only dreamed of living. We're living a life that Ezekiel only dreamed of living and that Jeremiah dreamed of living, that Daniel dreamed of living and, and Hosea, right, right through all the rest of the prophets. They were looking ahead to the things that Christ would provide for us through his sacrifice. They were looking ahead to the promise of these things that we each experience and we enjoy every single day. And so the prophets, he says, prophesied of it, but they never could really understand it. And he says, what you're experiencing is something that the prophets and the angels who look on at this big thing as spectators, they're intrigued by it. They're interested in it, but they just can't get a handle on how it works. So often in the Bible, the prophets wrote about things they just couldn't figure out. And yet praise the Lord that they were faithful and they were obedient to write it down anyway. Right? They could see the glory of Psalm 2, right? that beautiful messianic psalm about the, the Son, the Messiah, ruling and reigning over the nations. And yet they also saw the sufferings of Isaiah 53. Right? That key chapter talking about the way that the Messiah would be stricken and smitten and bruised. They could look in the scriptures and see the triumph on the Mount of Olives where we know that the Messiah is going to return and set his foot at his second coming, but they also saw the blood on Mount Calvary, right, where the Messiah died. And so they looked and they said, well, how could it be? How could it be that he would be despised, rejected, smitten, suffering, and yet also be ruling and reigning? This just doesn't make any sense. 
But the problem was they could see Mount Calvary. They could see the Mount of Olives. But what they didn't see is the valley that lies between the two of those. It's a valley of about 2,000 years. They didn't understand that what they were really writing about was two different comings. That the Messiah would come as a suffering savior before he returned as a conquering king. They didn't understand any of that, but we do understand all of that. And so for us too, in our lives, some of you this morning may be at a point where you're saying, look, I hear all of the promises, but I don't see any of the glory. And that's because so often there's this valley that separates them. And depending on what it is that you're going through, that valley might last a week or a month or a decade. It might even last a lifetime. And yet what Peter promises us is that God's plan is being unfolded nonetheless because glory always follows suffering. Always. Even though we don't see it, even though we can't see it at the time. See, and this is that hope, right? It's that confident expectation that we live in as believers, right? This blessed hope encourages us to live lives set apart to him and to live lives in holiness. Look at verse 13. He says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Peter says, look, because we understand these things that were just a mystery to the prophets and to the angels, because of all that, we need to think soberly and gird up the loins of our mind. Now, I don't know about you, but that sort of sounds like it could hurt, right? In Bible days, of course, men would wear kind of these ankle length robes, and yet if they wanted to move quickly or, or freely, they would kind of loop up the bottom of their robes over their belts, they would kind of have to sort of tie it up, sort of turn it into shorts, right? Of course, there's this helpful chart that I found on the internet. So men take note in case you ever have to do this. But the idea is that they would do this so they wouldn't get tripped up and so they wouldn't fall down. So what God is saying to us here, aside from that dumb chart, right, is that when we're in the middle of difficulty and trial, we need to tie up all of the loose ends of our thinking. Right? Our outlook needs to be in line with the word of God. And anything that's outside of that, out it goes. We need to be very disciplined about where we allow our mind to go. We're in a battle. We need to be sober. We need to not be under the influence of the world we need to be under the influence of the word of God and of all of those truths related to life and the rest that that provides us with, right? Maintaining that eternal perspective, walking set apart, it says in verse 14, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written be holy, for I am holy. So since we've been born again unto him, Peter says we need to live lives that are set apart to him. We need to live holy lives. Now, understand, holy doesn't mean perfect. It doesn't mean that you live in some sort of a state of sinless perfection. It simply means that you're set apart. You're separated unto God. Now, what's the temptation when you're in the middle of great persecution or of great trial? The temptation is to get out of it any way you possibly can. And very often, that means compromise. We bend a rule here. We bend a truth there. right? We sort of lower our standards a little over here just to get the heat turned out turned down a bit. Maybe we just drop a little pinch of that incense on the altar to Caesar and suddenly everything's fine in our business or everything's fine in our family. There's that temptation in the middle of a trial like this to look and to just say, you know what, I could very easily escape this thing with just a little bit of disobedience. 
I can be right out from under this. And Peter comes in and he says, it's not worth it. Nothing is worth that. It's not worth the compromise. He said, God said, be holy for I am holy, right? Stay separated from the world, be set apart to him. And I will also say this, it is often, it's during these times when we go through great difficulty that there's a tendency for us to drift right back into carnality. We say, you know, what's the use of all this? Let's just go get drunk. Or let's go back to using drugs. Or or let's get back out into the party scene. Or let's just medicate with a movie that we know we shouldn't be watching. Because these are the things that have brought us comfort in the past. And instead, we're to choose, even in the midst of this kind of difficulty, we're to choose to think rightly. It says in verse 17, and if you call on the Father... Who, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, he says, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your sojourning here in fear. So not only are we to think rightly, but also we're to think carefully. Because we know that our works are going to be judged at the end of this journey that helps us to walk in holiness. You may have heard another great expression that says that God chastens his children today and tests their works tomorrow. We've just talked about it in these last weeks. That happens at the judgment seat of Christ. Paul says that each one's work will become manifest for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. This is not a popular message, but there is a place for a healthy fear, right? A sense of reverence for the Lord in our lives, right? A a deep respect for who he is and who it is that has given me these commandments. Because when we're in the middle of persecution like this, there is this powerful fear of man that takes over, right? But the Bible says what? That the fear of man is a snare. And so we can be so dominated by the fear of man that we forget that it's the fear of God that keeps us clean. We want to say, Lord, I don't care what comes against me in the middle of all this pilgrimage, but by the time I get to the end of it, I want to have done it in a way that honors you. I want to fear and I want to respect you in all of this, knowing it says in verse 18 that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So this is perhaps the very best motivation of all the motivations to live lives that are holy and set apart. Peter reminds us of the price that was paid in order for us to have the privilege of living the life that we live as Christians. Right, the privilege of obeying God no matter the price. The privilege of not being numbered among the world but now being part of this family of God and the price that was paid for all of that to be possible was the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And that word precious there, it carries the idea of being priceless. There was a time in my life before I knew the Lord when I prided myself on my ability to solve any problem, right? Alleviate any situation by simply throwing money at it. Now, most often that meant, you know, at work, it was more equipment, more workers to get a job done in time. I confess to say oftentimes it was special rush, same day shipping, right? This was before Amazon, but rush shipping, right? In order to get that late ordered gift here in time for my wife so that I would look like a good guy. I became known in the industry that I worked as the guy that other guys would call because I could solve anything. And yet there came a point in my life when I was confronted with a problem that no amount of money, no amount of resources that I could possibly throw at it could ever solve. And that was when I was confronted with my own sin. And as I started to come to a realization of the weight of my sin before the Lord, I also came to that point of realizing how incapable I was 
of fixing this problem no matter how hard I tried. I needed help. And what I needed was the blood of Jesus. Why does it take the precious blood of Jesus to purchase each one of us? Because the Bible is very clear that the high cost of sin is always death. A life for a life. And so the next time we feel like we're drifting back into the sins of our past and struggling with carnality, the best thing we can do is to look at the priceless blood that burst from the veins of Jesus Christ as he hung on the cross. Look and see the thorns that were smashed into his skull and listen, if you will, to that crowd around him that mocked and cursed him and understand that this is what sin does. The only way that we will ever understand the real result of our sin is by having a fresh perspective of the cross and then to know in our hearts that this life that we've been given now it couldn't be purchased with any amount of money. It took the sinless blood of the spotless lamb of God in order for us to have this. Verse 20, Peter says that he indeed was foredained before the foundation of the world, but it was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Peter says, look, the, the death of Jesus on your behalf was planned by God before you were ever even born, and yet God in his grace has included us in that plan. What an incredible privilege that is. And what better way as believers do we have to possibly start to show our gratitude than simply surrender what we have to him? Paul says to the Corinthians, you are not your own. For you were bought at a price, therefore, he says, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, as we finish up, and these last verses will move quickly, right? We've seen that as believers, we've been redeemed by this precious blood. So because of that, we should live in hope and we should live in this holiness. And now finally, Peter concludes this first chapter of the letter to these writing to these hurting believers. And he stresses that we also need to live in harmony, right? Our salvation gives us this hope. It gives us this desire for holiness, but it also gives us this wonderful relationship with other believers. He says in verse 22 that since you've purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So the spirit of God loved us and brought us to Christ. And that very same spirit, Peter says, has planted within us a very special love for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. A sure sign of a life of holiness should be that there's a change in the relationship that we have with other children of the family of God because we're united by something that's much more powerful even than human blood. And that, Peter says, is the word of God. We're united in that. And in this context here of these people that Peter's trying to prepare for suffering and who are in the middle of it, he says we are to love, right? Agape love, sinlessly, sacrificially love one another through all of that because we need each other. Now, living here where we live, it is relatively easy still to find other Christians. If you don't like this group, or if you have trouble with that group, you can simply move on and find another group. But understand that to live in a part of the world where persecution is so great that they appreciate every single other Christian who is there walking with the Lord. And for me to really appreciate every single Christian who's trying to live their life for the Lord, trying to live by his word just the way that I am, and to appreciate them faults and failures and all. And not just to appreciate them, but to really love them. And not just to love them, but Peter says to love them fervently with a pure heart. That word fervent is a great one. It means at full stretch, 
It means no matter how much it stretches you, you need to love that brother. You need to love that sister. And how much do you think we stretch the Lord to love us? We stretch him every single day. And yet his love for us never fails. It never falters. And so we're to love each other in the same way because he says in verse 24, all flesh is as grass and all glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower fades away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. You know, at the end of the day, Peter says, the only thing that will last and the only thing that will matter is what we've done and the way that we have loved in obedience to the word of God. And here Peter again kind of reaches back into the, into the scriptures and he quotes Isaiah chapter 40 to make the point once again that we are just passing through and that all of this that we're passing through is passing away. We're just pilgrims, right? We're on our way to heaven. No matter how hard the difficulty gets, no matter what kind of doubts might creep in along the way, our future is as sure as the word of God, and there is nothing more sure in life than that. It's the word of God that brought us into this new life, and it's that very same word of God that's going to sustain us through these trials that are part of this pilgrim journey, no matter how bumpy the ride might be. Now, I want to close with a silly, stupid story, but I hope it's going to help us. Say you go to the airport to check in for a long flight, and the agent says to you, okay, your flight to London, it's, it's on time, but I have to tell you there's been some turbulence on the other flights today, but we absolutely guarantee that you are going to get there. Right? Our, our plane is in great shape. Our pilot is fully qualified. You might experience a bump or two, but we are going to get you there just fine. And you're standing there and you kind of think, well, that doesn't sound very good. This is a long, hard flight. Maybe there's a better way that I can get there. And so you go down to the next counter and you say, hey, do you have any seats available for the London flight? And they say, you bet we do. And we guarantee you are going to have a smooth ride. There's going to be no bumps, no jolts, no turbulence. We guarantee smooth sailing all along the way. It's the landing, though, that we're not exactly sure about. See, I have to say we've been having some problems with our landing gear. It's not working quite right. And we seem to have this problem once in a while where we land nose first. But we guarantee the flight will be smooth, even if the landing is a little bit iffy. Right? Stupid story, right? But if you had to choose between a smooth flight with a crash landing or a bumpy flight with a safe landing, no doubt you're going to get bumped around a little bit, right? And yet there are those who say, I don't want trials. I don't want to go against the world system." I don't want to deal with all of those things that you church people deal with, like reading the Bible or prayer or having to come to church on a Sunday morning. I just want smooth sailing. But it's so short-sighted. Of course, they're going to escape a bump or two presently, but ultimately they are headed for a fiery crash landing. And on the other hand, those of us who are presently dealing with this terrible turbulence, right? Maybe just maybe for you it's just a bump or two along the way, but we know that we are ultimately destined to make a safe landing someday in heaven. And that's what Peter is going to emphasize over and over throughout this letter. Right? He's trying to set our sights on the big picture of heaven itself so that we don't give up while we're here on earth. Amen? Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. And we thank you for your word and for the great encouragement, Lord, that it provides to us. Father, I know that there are those here with us this morning who are going through terrible difficulties in their lives, Lord, deep trials that, that, that Peter talks about here. And for those, Lord, I pray that you would minister these truths to their hearts in a very special way, Lord. For, for those of us who aren't in the throes of something like that, Lord, I pray that you would 
Tuck these truths away in our hearts for when we do need them, Father. When we come up against something that we can't deal with and we can't navigate our way through, Lord, we pray that the Spirit would bring to remembrance the things that Peter has taught us this morning. And so we thank you, Lord. We, we depend on you to do that, Lord. And we thank you and we praise you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand and let's, uh, let's worship the Lord together this morning.